Um, what's solving the collective action problem here? What's solving the collective in what in what sense? Well, first of all, what time period? In what what sense? Well, well, just in general. I mean, for example, you, at one point you think you have combat going on, and you seem to have you know pretty persuasive evidence that you have combat. And, you know, in combat, there's always a collective action problem, which is that the smart thing to do if someone's shooting at you is to fall on the ground. Yeah. And so all, in, all individuals do the smart thing, and no one ends up. Well, and so the way you have combat in modern so societies is that you train people not to, talk, not to do the smart thing. And um, some sort of training process uh, produces that, and actually it's got a very strong linguistic component, and it, and it produces, you know, somebody calls himself a marine and, and acts in this way. <laughs> yeah. Instead of hiding, he gets up and advances toward the opposition and shoots at them. Everybody does this, then you can know it. Yeah. Okay. Now, the same problem arises in despotism, right? It's Hobbes' famous point about, suppose there's some strong guy who can, um, you know, extract additional resources and make everybody else submit. That strong guy has to sleep, uh, therefore the others kill him. That's individual action, not collective action. So the only way he survives is by having people agree to protect him when he's asleep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in kind of early states, we see that kind of behavior all the time. So something's producing that in the same way as it is in the Marines. Yeah. And your, these environmental models just kind of take that for granted. And, and but I don't see how you, how you take that for granted. Well, at one level you can, at one level you can't. So I'm, I'm both agreeing with you and disagreeing with you. Okay, so the first problem we're trying to solve here is... Why did hunter-gatherers um, were not in this kind of situation, very constricted resources, a tight space, and, and highly productive environment with settled villages and so forth? Why did they not develop these political institutions? And one answer is that when somebody tried to organize them to fight a war, they just got up and left, because there was always some place to go. So there's a negative answer that is being addressed in this kind of modeling, and that is, these things happen when you have no place left to go. Right? Um, we're talking just about the islands, but the same process is happening on the mainland. All, all the drainages that are feeding village sites there of what eventually became the Chumash uh, people are also filled. Uh, they're also evolving into chieftain, and they're also engaging in warfare, and very similar things happen. So here, you know, by the time you, you know, for the initial part of the sequence, you can always move to the next habitat down the coast. And these people had explored these islands for 5,000 years before they ever settled them permanently. And then they, it took them 7,000 years to fill up, so they know these habitats beautifully. They know them so well, so they can pick the right one. Okay. Eventually reach a point where you can't there's no place left to go. So you've got to stick around. Now, the question about how do you keep them from, you know, how do you, how do you keep the uh, subordinates from killing the chief in his sleep? Well, the person may not be in their advantage to do so, because now you're in a world that's full of hostile, competing village sites, the mouths of these drainages, and that guy, although he's taking a third of what you're producing, it may be necessary. So it may be the best of a bad choice not to kill him. And then, I, I grant you, we, this does not take account of all the kinds of linguistic and uh, ethnic and identity processes that that chief has to make you think that it's really good to keep him around. No, I agree, that's not in there, but that's, that's another process to model. So you remarked on the special nature of island um, ecologies and yeah. talking about the, the ideal free distri distribution, but I expected you to say the same thing about the ideal despotic distribution, particularly as regards to settling of Polynesia, because one of the things about the Pacific is that the islands are um, clustered and then big spaces in between yeah. them, right? So if, in fact, you've got this world where um, despots have, have grown exploitative and um, and there's nowhere to go um, because the you know the next valley is full of an equally horrible despot and, uh, yeah. and such. 
then hiving off by setting off a, a, you know, a, 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 over the horizon isn't the same as moving to another island in the chain because they can't get you there, right? You're beyond the yeah. reach of the despots. Yeah. So it seems like it introduces a new dynamic. It would introduce a new dynamic. In, well, okay, so think of this from the point of view of my head's very stuck in the moment. So you hive off. You take your canoe load. Highly risky thing because sure. you may not know what's out there. There may be nothing out there the direction you go. Um, but then you get there, and I suppose the next question is, are you all going to be egalitarian now, like the Habitat too, or are you going to recreate despotism? And if, if that's the dynamic you're talking about, and we haven't, we haven't even tried to touch that kind of... Yeah, and, and I would say, um, just you know, with a nod to the, the cultural evolution component, independent of the ecological considerations, since those people are arriving with heads full of um, ideas about you know, um, uh, divinity and hierarchy mm -hmm. and so on. And right? kings and chiefs. Exactly. So it's, it's likely to accelerate that process just because that's the, that's the right order of the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You would carry with you your notions of kingship. Sure. And that would suggest that you end up recreating society that then... I, I think the trick here is, and this is, we really haven't started to model this, is if you are too despotic, you really create incentive to leave, but you don't allow the population to grow rapidly enough to have the population push to leave. There's some balance, balance in there. But yeah, you carry your, your notion of kingship with you. Um, I, I have to point out that um, the characterization of, of the later villages on the island as being in defensive positions is not really a, a, an appropriate portrayal of their locations. Every one of those villages is right on the shoreline. Including the one I showed you, the house mountain yeah, on the top? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right above the shore. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think although there is good, Pat Lambert's got clear evidence for, and, and others, Mark Rob and others who work mm -hmm. in the area, uh, the mainland as well, have clear evidence for, um, considerable, often sublethal, violent encounters around uh, 12 to 1300 BP. There, it, what's interesting is the later period, the, the, the last 500 years before European settlement, is actually a period of, of considerable calm. Yeah, and, and you saw that in the graph I showed yeah. you, right? It really dropped off. So I didn't I'm, draw attention to that. <laughs> yeah, so there yeah. really isn't, there isn't defensive positioning, there isn't, there isn't really much uh, lethal violence in any period. There's a lot of sublethal head bashing going on, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. Uh, but the later period is not marked by uh, by any of these behaviors. There seems to be a long period of relative calm, exchange, uh, cooperation, rather than competition and violence. So I'm wondering how that er enters into your modeling, what you'd expect. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and Lambert's data is, is pointed out that the 650 date, the last one on that, the, the, at least as she measured it, the lethal violence drops off. Um, there is, however, a fair amount of ethno-historic evidence from Spanish accounts and others that there was warfare going on when they came through. So I'm, you know, there still is some pretty, you know, whole villages being decimated and routed, for instance, as I think it handles one. Yeah, I think periodic, but not, not incessant. Not yeah, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue it's incessant. It's, it's periodic will do, I think, in this. And as far as the, the thing dropping off with, you know, look, well, let's assume for a minute that it really does peak and then decline, as that graph would suggest, if we're willing to take that as evidence. Um, I don't know what kind of, of thing to say about that, except that you might expect more turmoil of this sort when you're first getting these chieftains set up. That is, they haven't they haven't consolidated a system of understanding about <coughs> whose chiefs and which villages are going to be dominant over others and, and so forth. And it could be that as chieftains really get settled into place, it's a stabilizing influence and drops off the level of violence, you know, towards toward the end. Oh, that that's that's speculation. But. That's yeah. That, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, David Anderson, who works on chieftains in the southeastern United States, um, 
takes a different tack that the chiefdoms are inherently unstable and are constantly yeah. cycling uh, uh, yeah. in and out of uh, greater political uh, coherence and uh, would, would probably suggest that that's unlikely that there would be a long period of stability. One of the things you see here, and I, I tried to depict it a bit in that first slide, or one of the first slides that showed the sort of the situation in 1542 is, first of all, there were multiple chiefdoms. They're sometimes in adjacent villages. There were occasionally more than one chief per village. So, you know, we're early in the evolution of political hierarchy here. This is, this is not really about states, for instance. This is about the appearance of, of over a period of maybe 1,400 years, we'd probably say a little less, maybe 800 to 1,000 years, of Hierarch, you know, ranked hierarchical societies with strong leadership, looking like chiefdoms, but it's just beginning. It's starting to work out, and then the Spanish show up, and it kind of all gets stopped. How does the settlement of the Channel Islands fit in with the longer history of the Chumash? Were they less suitable areas that were settled only after the coast was full? Um. The settlement came from the coast. We've got Chumash experts in here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, well, it's well, the coastal it, zone kind of leading the islands and the development. I, I don't know the archaeology of the coast that well. Well, the very earliest sites are, uh, are actually on the islands. The earliest Chumash the earliest sites are on the are islands? On the island. The, well, this is the very earliest, but the earliest are the earliest village sites out there? That's a difficult question to answer. Yeah. Because the, the earliest village sites are normally multi-component sites that, that are included, so those earliest components are usually buried. And it's, it's very hard to define what is a village and what the spatial extent is of the deeply buried shell But um, early, the, the, there is a presumed population continuity, so I, I thought your question was asking whether the Chumash people were intrusive onto an existing population of, of different... No, 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 I just thought they were living around, you know, Santa Monica and, and uh, up the coast, and then things got full there, so no. they went to the Channel Islands, but that's Doesn't not the really case. Mean, there's, there's no, I think the best way of putting it is there's no clear evidence of what, which set of coastlines was more heavily occupied or Earlier, it's yeah. It's really not clear. And and I can't I can't resist saying that you would expect that from the idea of free distribution if the coastal sites are about as valuable in terms of their suitability for human habitation as some of those islands. Like you expect the whole thing to fill up based on the local suitability of the site, not necessarily coast versus islands. If um, <coughs> if you have something resembling ethnic identities or kin groups which will feel moral obligations within the group but not toward people outside the group. The problem, I mean, the question is the ideal free distribution requires that people be able to move whenever they want to, but if you move and you get killed because nobody, <coughs> nobody's your kin, nobody cares about you, nobody thinks you're human, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, you have a, a nice knife at your side and so we'll all kill you and you decide who gets the knife, you know, the question is whether the ideal free distribution, whether it's really possible for somebody who speaks a different language or is, just doesn't have your identity or isn't your brother to, you know, when he shows up, what do you do? Do you, do you say, oh, join us, uh, or, oh, oh look, look at this guy, he's arriving, let's kill him. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> and let me, let me take this back to actually the development of Carnero's theory and argue that I think there would be something parallel here. Now, what I tried to say here is this probably starts out something like the ideal free distribution. We got a nice model fit because we were talking about the earliest settlement component. So we're still talking about low population density, things are pretty easy, no one's under a lot of pressure, there's room to move to the next site down the coast, whether you're on the mainland or the islands, or maybe back and forth between them in, in some way or another. And, and the idea in, in terms of the model is, as it fills up, you have a gradual shift towards a more despotic situation where what you're talking about is exactly the case. There is less and less opportunity to move, to leave. And it could be because 
there's no more habitat available to you that's suitable, or uh, this would be fully consistent, I think, with the model. It could be that you're surrounded by people who don't like you. But it doesn't require right. a despot to kill strangers. People, no. people often kill strangers without, I, mean, I don't know, I haven't studied this, but I, it seems to me that, that, that a cheap, you know, an acephalous society might perfectly well kill strangers. No, yeah. but Alan, I mean, the, at least another body of theory and um, some archaeological evidence that speaks to that is that, that the, the evolution of, of the ethnic identities um, and the language diversity that you're describing comes precisely as you get um, increased competition for resources so that the intergroup conflict is driving the evolution of the, um, uh, the, the cultural technology for cooperation and mass action. Right? And if that's the case, then you don't, you know, at low population densities when you're in the early stages of the ideal free distribution, um, you know, people, you know, as far as you can go, basically, they're at least understandable. And I mean that's consistent with these extremely long distance trade networks that we see, you know, very early in species history, right? So clearly people were going they were traveling long distances, they were interacting with other people, it wasn't constant hostility. And the constant hostility is more likely to arise. I mean, take New Guinea as a you know hallmark case, when there is you know, resource abundance, the niches all fill up and you start to get evolution of social complexity. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's known about whether you know, people are cooperative or welcoming or tolerant even of strangers and the relationship of that to complexity of the hierarchy. It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. it, it's, so, it's crucial for the ideal free distribution model that you actually be able to move. That the you be able to move, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're is, assuming that. The yeah. question is what, what's, the, what's the ethnographic evidence among hunter gatherers and so forth that people can do that? You know, well, among hunter gatherers, the evidence is pretty good for that. People are moving around all the time, and it's uh, now how, how accurately I don't know, but it's I think it'd be fair to say ethnographically, it's kind of an article of faith amongst hunter gatherer people, uh, experts, anthropologists, type, that one of the ways that hunter gatherers avoid social hierarchy is by movement. I mean, yeah. when somebody starts to act even the slightest bit despotic, everyone else gets up and leaves. And that's because, you know, like the Kung Song through their, you know, their reciprocity networks and so forth, you generally can go. And, and you commonly will be tolerated, if not welcomed, for where you end up. Um, I, I wanted to go back, circle back and make the, the point in, in terms of Robert Carnero's work. He started out uh, with his environmental circumscription model in the 1970 paper saying basically it's ecological. And he was thinking about the origin of the state in Peru and then where you get these coastal valleys where you can irrigate, but once you're beyond the irrigation zone, it's just nothing but sand. And so it was a very ecological vision of what limited you. Eventually, as he worked towards encompassing more and more cases in his analysis and had to confront situations like some evidence in tropical lowland Amazon region for the evolution of chieftains and, and perhaps state level societies where you weren't getting those kinds of really strong ecological barriers, then he started thinking more in terms of social barriers. You know, you, your options to leave are not limited by earning a living somewhere else. It's that there's someone else there and they don't want to give their space up. And so I think that that's important. There was, there's a lot of evidence um, at the point of contact for movement of people. I mean, there's a lot of trade back and forth between the islands and the mainland. There are marriages moving back and forth across that zone and so forth. So people are moving around a lot when they're not fighting with them. Yeah. Um, one of the, you know, I don't actually know this, I'm kind of guessing, but if you look at a similar island colonization problem in a historic period. If you look at Greek cities, don't you get expeditions led by members of the oligarchy or, or deputed by the king, if it's got a king, and sends them out to various locations around it? And do we have a reason to think that Polynesian or, or you know, American Indian 
colonization isn't sort of similar. I mean, at the Polynesian stage, uh, yeah. uh, then, you know, you send along one of these. And furthermore, you have kind of similar um, terms in all the Polynesian languages for um, what these nobles are called from one island to the next. And so, you know, that's some sort of evidence that the that this person, yeah. that, that these expeditions have been led by such a guy. And it seems to me that, that you know, as I say, solutions to the collective action problem actually kind of help you understand why your prediction was reversed when you did the population policy in the case. And it, it might also explain why you have uh, such, a, such a confounded signal in this data. One way to look at that statistical signal is it's a strong signal. Another way to look at it is it's, it's not a strong signal. Um, Why isn't it a strong signal? If there are lots of reasons not to expect the pattern and you find it anyway. Well, but the the, the signal itself, the, my view of that signal is that it's, it's, it's what you found out was the one really poorly estimated <coughs> factor. I mean, as you say, you did sort of intuitive weighting of those factors and you found out that one of the four factors that you thought mattered um, actually mattered in the final statistical result, but you know it didn't sort of matter very much. And well, it actually matters a fair amount. Well, I mean, but that's, yeah. the, that's the exact dispute here. Is, is that yeah. a fair amount, or is that not very much? Or is it not it very much? It, 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 I'll it tell you, mattered, if you're, if you're an archaeologist, it looks really good. good. <laughs> it, 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 it mattered more than a random amount, but you know we all know the standard statistical problems with more than. Yeah. Um, okay, let me, let me work backwards through that. It actually matters a lot more than a random amount because we have gone back and done the test where we take these 46 watersheds and we populate them randomly and we generate the model that way. <coughs> and we've actually done the null hypothesis. Could this have been random? And the answer is no. It, it couldn't have been random. So, the, so statistically speaking, within... You know, within the area of the kind of data we're using, and it's all radiocarbon and all that kind of stuff, um, it's a pretty good fit. Let me uh, let me step back to what I think was the beginning of the question, which um, is really intriguing to me, and that is, I thought you were implying that we assume it's the subordinates who left, right? Yes. Why not the fourth son of the chief, who's looking around and saying, you know, I'm fourth in line here. Things are looking pretty bad for me. Why isn't that individual leaves? And my only answer to that is it's a great question. It would be a lot of fun to try to figure that out. I don't know the answer ethnographically, but it would be, or ethnohistorically, it would be a lot of fun to try to model that and try to find it out. Because it might have been. We, you're right, we did make the assumption that it's the subordinates who have the greatest reason to leave. But if, you're, if your oligarchy is or your population of despots is hierarchical within itself, then then you've kind of got a second order hierarchy embedded in the first order. Yeah. 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 Plus the military technology advantage, so the threat in Sicily and Poland and eventually in Poland, all was driven by. Uh, if you wanted to be a lord, uh, you needed land, and if you're old, if you're younger brother, uh, and uh, it's quite good. Uh, in, yeah, uh, the evil history. Of that. Yeah, I'll get that, get that reference from you later. There, there's a there's kind of an analog with the the Inca expansion in that <coughs> each of the either the 13 ancient kings, when the king died, <coughs> his offspring didn't inherit yeah, any yeah. of his own lands. They only inherited the right to try to generate more than themselves. Those lands continued to serve the dead king, actually literally served yeah, the yeah. dead king. And uh, so that drove, that's been argued by Demarest and others to drive a very rapid race. If you were starting this project from scratch, you might have some concerns about dealing with islands because of boundary effects and things. So the question is, 
how does this apply to other mainland contexts and other specific things about the island which might mm. make this complicated? Like, for uh, you mentioned that canoes are presumably they're getting all of their resources from the sea. Um, do they partition up the space in the sea around their uh, population? Yeah. Um, for the purpose of the model and the analysis of environment, we took a two kilometer radius around the mouth of the watershed, and that's kind of the average interspacing of those of those settlements. That's the way we did that. So that's pretty arbitrary. There may have been other ways of dividing up those those marine resources. The broader question, how does this translate to uh, say continental or more terrestrial environments, non island environments? And there's you know there's a lot of work in ecology that some of those terrestrial environments are very heterogeneous in the nature of islands. That is, you have little hot spots of good resources surrounded by what might as well be ocean surface, even though it's still terrestrial. In those cases, I would argue it should work pretty well, allowing for changes in parameters like the, the difficulty of moving trade goods and all of that, that business. We're actually, at, at the moment, trying to do something like this in the Maya lowlands in southern Belize. That's kind of the next step of this project. Uh, all of us who are engaged in this are, are working with a group of archaeologists in a, a site in Toledo district. Seeing if there is enough landscape heterogeneity to make a process like this look feasible. Uh, Mayanists have, have argued that. They, intuitively, without actually referring to it, argued an ideal free distribution type scenario where you have very good quality soils on low slopes and soggy lowlands and karst uplands and so forth, and they break this up and show that they were settled in the order you would predict and fill up. Um, how, how tight that is, I don't know. So I, it, it's worth exploring. That's that's my argument. Yeah, but it's going to be pretty variable depending on how heterogeneously island-like your terrestrial environment turns out to be. Yeah. So I confess that models make my head hurt. It's not that like these things don't come intuitively to me at all. And so uh, that's, than, me too. That's why I have these helpers. <laughs> um, Perhaps this was in the model and I didn't see it, but in the, in the despotism case, it, it seems to me that there is an optimum level of exploitation, um, both with regard to growth um, from the perspective of voting with one's feet and the subordinates with one's feet, but also in terms of the returns that the despot gets, right? So you, yeah. you mentioned health and stature and all those kinds of things, right? I mean, that presumably, the highly despotic overlord um, uh, it, is getting a lower per capita uh, return on his exploitation um, mm -hmm. uh, than the less despotic, and there must be some, you know, optimum point there at which, combined with growth, that's the most successful way to build your kingdom. Yeah, and and it's that's another, it's a great question, and we're we're just starting to model that. Um, we have we we have in the. There's a paper that is finished, but uh, just finished as of about 36 hours. Um, we actually have a variable called tillage, which is a, a European term that refers to the what the peasant owed the lord that you could not refuse to give. And the, the term actually comes up in the Magna Carta, which is why it's so fun. It's part of the, the discussion of liberation of this, this particular kind of regime. But we have a term in there that we try to represent that. And it turns out that what, what it does, for, so the question is, in the models I showed you, I assume the despot consumes as much as a peasant. Right? Which, if you think about it, is a pretty poor despot, right? If they're only doing as well as the peasants. So with this, this term I'm calling to lodge, we, we basically say, no, let's let the despot assume twice as much, three times as much, four times, because they have to have retinues and build monuments and conduct feasts and do all this kind of stuff to be a proper uh, chief or despot. And it, and it turns out what that does 
at equilibrium in the habitat which despots share with has dramatically decreased the number of subordinates and despots who share that space because we're kind of diverting all these resources off into, into a use that's not for reproduction. It turns out it doesn't affect the timing. It doesn't affect the timing of the start of the population of the second habitat and, and so forth. And, um, we can demonstrate that. I, I'm not going to claim we understand it yet. I mean, to understand it, we're going to have to play with the math that lies behind the model and you know, solve some equations for that particular term and figure it out. But that's that's as far as we've gotten on that. Um, but you're right. It's another it's another trade-off. Uh, not only you know, how how much do you try to extract in order to create the kind of um, conditions you need to be a successful despot. And by condition, I mean the retinue and the retainers and the person who's going to protect you from the person who's going to, who you're paying enough to protect you from, the cheater is going to try to kill you or so forth. 